All right, welcome everybody. Um, really excited for uh, our next speaker, Kim Kelly. It's, uh, you're, in a, you're in for a real treat. Her book is incredible, and I urge everyone to get a copy. Uh, I can sell you one here through Venmo, PayPal, or cash, or you can order one online um, through, with your credit card. Um, and uh, Professor Liz Polcha is going to introduce How are we doing today? Good. Good. Okay, so I'm Liz Polcha. I'm an assistant professor of English here at Drexel, and I'm incredibly excited to introduce labor journalist, organizer, and local Philadelphian Kim Kelly today. So many of you might already know her from her recent interview with the College of Arts and Sciences that was posted this week. She graduated from Drexel with a focus in the music industry, and she published an incredible book on labor history last year, Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor, which focuses on the histories of people who have been excluded from mainstream narratives of what labor looks like in America, including narratives about disabled workers and disability rights, sex workers, and incarcerated workers. And that's what Kim is going to be reading from today. So Kim has a wildly impressive career in journalism since she graduated from Drexel, publishing in so many major outlets that I can't list them all here, but they include The New Republic, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Baffler, The Nation, and perhaps my favorite, her brilliant column for Teen Vogue. Some of you might also know her in-depth and dedicated reporting on the working conditions of coal miners in Alabama and the Warrior Met Coal Strike, which is the longest strike in Alabama's history. So we have many reasons to be excited to hear Kim speak today, but I wanted to share with you why I'm excited in particular to introduce her in the context of a writing festival. So I know we have some students in the room. You might be wondering, why should creative writers care about labor history? Like, why have this talk in the context of a writing festival? Well, we are currently living in a moment in which higher education, the publishing industry, and workers in the cultural sector more broadly are increasingly attuned to improving their working conditions and battling precarity in their workplaces. In the past few years, we've seen an incredible uprising among writers, researchers, teachers, editors, journalists, artists, curators, art handlers, and students fighting for higher wages, health care, and job security. Creative writers are fighting against gig economies and the adjunct crisis in higher education, where their work is too often devalued. And we are seeing this right now with the Writers Guild of America strike, where roughly 11,000 film and TV writers are on strike, and there are picket lines outside of major Hollywood studios and writers' rooms in New York. So these are struggles that extend beyond increasing pay and benefits for individuals, these organizers are modeling how we can collectively rewire the extreme labor inequality and job crisis in the arts, humanities, and higher education, and beyond. So, as writers, academics, staff, and students in this room, we have a lot to learn from labor history and from Kim's incredible work about how to move forward in our current moment with precarious working conditions. And just to wrap up, I'll say on a personal note, I come from a union family. My dad was a teamster and a dock worker in Cleveland, Ohio. I know we have other people with union families in the room. Liz Heenan, your mom was a garment IL, worker. ILGWU member. Yes, um, exactly. Um, so I've also um, worked as an organizer as a graduate student worker in Boston, as well as um, a faculty member in Mississippi with United Campus Workers. And currently, as Philadelphia area, area faculty, I'm also a non-collective bargaining member of the United Academics of Philadelphia, which is associated with AFT, which any faculty or staff at a Philadelphia region college or university can join. So I could keep gushing about my admiration for Kim's work and my solidarity with cultural workers and higher education, but like you, I'm really eager to hear Kim's reading, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and hand things over to her. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. I know I look like this, but I have a really quiet voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that intro. 
Gosh, I'm blushing over here. And also, I'm really excited that you, you uh, shouted out my union, the Writers Guild, who are on strike right now. There's actually been a couple picket lines in the Philadelphia area, like more suburban. They keep saying, Philly pickets. I'm like, ain't nobody going out to Acton. But in case you feel like going on a road trip, it is possible to come support the union and the writers as they're on strike. But yeah, it's, it's so wonderful to hear you talk about the idea of creative workers organizing and about the academics and the researchers and the writers across the country who have been organizing and fighting and winning. Because it was not like this when I first got involved in the labor movement. And really, I only got involved in the labor movement kind of by accident in the way that I think a lot of people get involved. Uh, some people at my workplace came to me one day and said, hey, we're thinking about organizing. Are you into that? I was like, oh, yeah, cool. We can do that? Sick. <laughs> <laughs> because at that point, I was working at Vice, which is always a complicated place, right? I think they're about to go bankrupt at this point. Probably shouldn't have laid me off in 2019. <laughs> but I was working there in 2014 as the heavy metal editor. And I come, like you, I come from a union family, union tradition, very blue-collar, working-class rural area in the Pine Barrens in Jersey, if you're familiar. I guess if you're a Sopranos fan, it's probably the only way you would have heard about it. <laughs> but it's out there. We're out there. Um, but I never thought I would have the opportunity to join a union, even if I was politically aligned with it, even if I did know they were a good thing, because I was a writer, and specifically as a music journalist, basically writing about heavy metal on the internet. And I did not think there was exactly, you know, like a Metalheads Local 666 that were going to come and knock on my door and hand me a union card. But there kind of was, in a way, in that the Writers Guild of America came and they helped us organize editorial workers at Vice, and then we organized. 400 other workers advice and we got a contract and we got another contract and it just kind of took over my life because up until that point you know as as you mentioned i i went here i was a music industry student on the business track which is it was kind of a funny place for me to end up because i just wanted to be a music journalist and that's a very specific thing i mean not even just i feel like most people who've watched almost famous have kind of toyed with that idea at one point in time but i really wanted to do it and I came here, I uh, didn't actually graduate, but I came close. And I, I learned a lot of important lessons about relating to people and opening up and just learning about the world around me because I'm from such a rural, isolated place. And by the time I got involved in the industry and got that job of vice and started organizing, I was equipped to actually relate to my coworkers and cross various lines that the bosses had drawn around us and really just see how important it was that we were coming together and fighting and winning. And I'm not the only worker who has felt throughout history that unions weren't for me or that I didn't have a place in the labor movement. A lot of people have felt that way or more specifically been made to feel that way. There has been almost a concentrated effort throughout history to make some people feel like they don't belong. Their labor doesn't matter. Their lives don't matter. Their voices don't matter. And we all know that's bullshit. But I got the opportunity to write this book. And I was very, very clear about the fact that I wanted to focus on the people and the stories and the movements that haven't gotten top building, haven't gotten the recognition they deserve, haven't gotten their flowers. You know, I've read a lot of labor history books. And I would recommend, you know, some of them. There are <laughs> some are drier than others, some are more inclusive than others, some are more fun than others. And I know I wanted to write a fun book. More importantly, I wanted to write a book that was inclusive and showed exactly who has been here the whole time and what we've done and how we've done it and try and show that no matter who you are and where you work, whatever your identity is, wherever you came from, wherever you're going, you do have a place in the labor movement. Well, before I choke up my other lung, I do want to read a little bit from this book I wrote. <laughs> There's two little sections. I promise they're short because... No one wants to sit here and listen to story time for 40 minutes straight. But uh, these two people I'm going to tell you about really represent a lot about what I was trying to get through, <laughs> what I was trying to convey with this book, and the kind of, oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the folks I'm going to introduce you to, they represent a lot of just the ideas and kind of political thought that went into the way I organized this book and chose the people I wrote about and the way I wrote about them. So first, 
again, I'm glad you mentioned my coal miners in Alabama. I spent the past two years covering a strike down there that got very little media attention, very little support from outside the community, but was a really interesting story and was really important and changed a lot of people's lives. And in covering that, <coughs> I became really interested <coughs> in the history of coal mining. You know, it's not something that you necessarily think about a lot if you live up here, if you're not from that community, if you're not necessarily thinking about energy and extraction or labor history. But for some people, it's everything. And as much as it is a difficult and dirty and dangerous job, some people love doing it. And people have fought for the ability to have that job. And I'm gonna tell you about one of them, a woman who is, she's often mistakenly referred to as the first woman coal miner. That's not accurate. Uh, there are, there have been, there's historical evidence that actually incarcerated black women were some of the first women to enter the mines in the U.S. And they weren't given a choice. And I wasn't able to find their names. But I wanted to make sure I had them in the book at the very least because whenever you come across a mainstream reading, it talks about someone being the first. That's often not the full story. Sometimes they're the first that chose to do that, the first they were able to do that, but not everyone has had the choice to be the first. But her story is still interesting and relevant, and I just think she's fun. So I'm gonna tell you about one of my favorite people in the book, Ida Mae Stull, from chapter five. I'll try not to cough up a lot. It'll be a little too on the nose talking about coal mining. <laughs> Ida Mae Stoll always knew she was different. Born with what she'd later call a twisted up leg, in her youth, the coal miner's daughter used leg braces to get around her hometown of Sayo, Ohio. Even when she was a grade schooler, the independent streak that would make her famous was already on full display. She refused to be shamed for her disability by her classmates or anyone else. And as she later told the Chicago Tribune at just seven years old, Ida declared that she was finished with being disrespected at school. Ain't nobody gonna laugh at me. Newspaper reports disagree on at exactly what age Stoll first entered the mines herself. Some say 12, others say eight, and after her legend had grown, a few even claimed a tender age of six. Regardless of what the calendar said, it's a fact that she was only a little girl when she first started following her father underground to help dig coal. At first, she was only a helper, carrying her dad's lantern and pushing the coal cart ahead at the side. But as she got older and stronger, she became a formidable miner in her own right, regularly hauling out six or seven carts a day for her $2 daily wage. A teenage stall worked alongside her husband in a small Eastern Ohio country bank drift mine, an independent operation dug out of the Appalachian Hills by hand. By 1933, in her mid-30s, she had become part owner of a mine near Jewett, Ohio, a first for a woman in the mining business. Things were going pretty well for her and her family. The mortgage was paid, the kids were thriving, and Stoll was doing what she liked best, avoiding women's work around the house and digging coal. Photos of her from the time period show a tall, statuesque woman with, a muscled, with muscled forearms, a steely squint, and a determined set to her jaw. So kind of like me, if I spent all of my time digging coal instead of sending emails. <laughs> but in late January 1934, word kicked up about federal mine inspectors sniffing around Ida May's business. She saw a mortal threat to everything she had worked for over the past two decades. Stoll wasn't working alone in the mines anymore. Desperate for labor, operators had been forced by the Great Depression to, at least temporarily, suspend their prejudices and allow women underground to work alongside the men. Though Appalachian women like Stoll had been quietly working in family-owned mines for decades, Ohio state law forbid the weaker sex from engaging in a host of manual labor jobs, coal mining included. Stoll was both pioneer and outlaw, and she knew that the lawmen would find her eventually. When that day finally came in early February, her female coworkers hid 
while Stoll prepared to give their visitor a proper welcome. I knew he was coming to put me out, so I put some rotten eggs in my coal cart, she later explained. I started throwing and chased that inspector out of the mine to his car and covered the car besides. I really stunk him up. Ida made valiant efforts notwithstanding. James Derry, chief of Ohio's Bureau of Mines, responded to her stunt with an order that she leave her job at once. Stull appealed the order and took the fight to court, where the press dubbed her the Amazon of the coal pits and seemed to regard her with a mixture of derision and awe. Her stern, snappy one-liners during interviews helped solidify her reputation as a woman it was best not to cross. One choice soundbite. I could show that mine inspector a thing or two when it comes to muscle. Unfortunately, Stoll's ownership stake proved to be the determining factor. <laughs> ultimately, Stoll's ownership stake proved to be the determining factor, and she was allowed to return to work in 1935. Despite the headaches and the hassles, Stoll liked her job and was furious at the implication that her time would be better spent in the kitchen doing what she termed baby work. Moreover, she was good at it. A 1935 article marveled, any miner in the district will admit that she's his equal physically. And Stoll herself took pride in her ability to outwork her male counterparts. She didn't mind the hard labor, the dirt, or the coal dust. To her, it was vastly preferable to a more traditional life indoors. Overalls, boots, and a miner's cap suit me better than silks, slippers, and a butterfly hat, she told one reporter. My face gets black, but I prefer coal dust to a powder puff, and I'd rather use a crosscut saw than a golf club. That may sound unladylike, but every woman to her own desires. Mine is digging coal. Stoll's mining career ended in 1944. Her husband died that year, and without her partner by her side, she found she lost her taste for coal. She spent the next 40 years in peaceful obscurity caring for her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and scraping out a living on her farm in Sayo. True to form, she prided herself on her self-sufficiency and ability to work well into her old age. In one of her last interviews, she made it plain that her fighting spirit had never faded. I still got my strength, she told the reporter. Ain't afraid of man or woman, and I can still find coal in these hills. Ida Mae Stoll died on April 23rd, 1980, at the age of 84. Don't you just love her? So yeah, she, was, she wasn't a union. She wasn't an organizer. She was just a regular person who found herself pressed into extraordinary circumstances because she refused to be told what she could do or who she could be. And I just love that as a lesson because as important as unions and organizing collective effort is, sometimes it just takes one person to stand up and say, no, to change history, or at least change one small town in Ohio, and butterfly effect that into a much bigger situation. So that was Ida. That was kind of a fun story. There's another person I want to read to you about that has a much less heartwarming ending. I'm not going to spoil it yet, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, not a, it's not a happy story. And I chose for a reason that I will tell you about after I introduce you to Nagi Daifula. And a little bit of background on this. Um, we're fast forwarding and crossing the country. We're in California in the 70s. This is uh, 1973. The grape and lettuce boycott, Sour Bowl strike which happened after the, the big one, the big uh, Delano grape strike that we know about with Cesar Chavez, the United States farm workers. That's one of like the big strikes I think a lot of people know about. But there are a lot more that happened afterwards and before and are continuing to happen, right? And this one got a little bit less attention. It was a little less, it had a little bit more to do with jurisdiction and the Teamsters were involved and they weren't like, they're a lot more fun these days. The Teamsters were not fun in the 70s. So there's a lot going on, but just to give you a little bit of background, that's, that's where we're at. So, in the late 1960s and 1970s, political turmoil in Yemen led thousands of young men to emigrate to the U.S. to find work in some measure of peace. 
Most of them ended up in Detroit auto factories, but about 5,000 made their way to California, where they joined Mexican and Filipino agricultural workers in the verdant fields of the San Joaquin Valley. The Yemenis were initially welcomed by employers who assumed the Arab workers would be docile, but as with the Filipinos before them, surviving unrest and revolution at home had left them with a politically radical outlook and a fearless hunger to organize. Among them was a slim 24-year-old anti-imperialist named Nagi Daifula, who had once dreamed of becoming a doctor, but instead became an organizer and translator for the UFW. He was very courageous, encouraging us and telling us, this is democracy, and if you want your rights, this is how you do it. Ahmed Yaya Mushra, a former grape picker and UFW member who marched alongside Daifula and now works as a janitor with, with SIU Local 87, you fight for your rights. This is the United States. As tensions between the strikers, the Teamsters, and the police ratcheted up, Daifula took on a greater role as a strike captain. He spoke Arabic, English, and Spanish, drawing praise for his versatility from Cesar Chavez, who said, he gave himself fully to the grape strike and farm worker justice. The young organizer's courage took him out onto the front lines, but also painted a target on his back. On August 15, 1973, as he stood outside a cafe shooting the breeze with a group of farm workers, three Kern County sheriffs pulled up and started hassling them. Deputy Gilbert Cooper turned his attention on Daifula, who had spoken up in the workers' defense and gave chase as Daifula tried to leave. The deputy smashed his heavy flashlight into Daifula's head, severing the much smaller man's spinal cord at the base of his skull. The two other deputies then dragged Nagi's limp body across the pavement by his feet, bumping his head along the ground and leaving a smear of blood on the concrete. They left his mangled body in the gutter and arrested three of the workers he'd been trying to protect. Daifula would not survive his injuries, passing away as thousands of supporters held a vigil outside the hospital. 7,000 people accompanied Daifula's casket on a funeral procession that stretched for 11 miles, and his body was sent home to Yemen for a much-deserved rest. UFW President Cesar Chavez spoke at his funeral and later wrote to his father in Yemen, so long as farm workers struggle to be free, Nagi's memory will burn bright in their hearts. The murder galvanized the strikers, and he became the first martyr for La Casa. Juan de la Cruz became the second when he was shot dead on the picket line on August 16th, just a few days after Daifula had drawn his last breath. Two years later, California passed the 1975 California Agricultural Labor Relations Act, which established collective bargaining rights for farm workers. And in 1977, the UFW and the Teamsters finally made peace with a stable jurisdictional agreement. Labor peace arrived just a little later, as the UFW ended its boycotts of lettuce, grapes, and wine in February 1978. When farm workers gathered to vote in those first legal union elections, there were many Yemenis from the Joaquin Valley among them. They cast their votes in honor of Nagi Dai. So if I was in a different environment, I would convey this sentiment a little differently. But uh, <laughs> the, the cops are not your friends is essentially what I'm getting at with that. And I'm not saying that in a flippant sense. That's something that I think is really apparent throughout this book and really just throughout labor history, the fact that, you know, when it comes to the Battle of Blair Mountain or Ludlow or picket lines that we see right now, the state has very seldom been on the side of the workers and the working class and unions. I mean, whether it's, it's the current administration busting up a railroad strike or our rickety labor laws that continue to exclude the most marginalized workers. You know, that is a, a piece of labor history and American history that can be uncomfortable for some people to reckon with. They don't like thinking about that. They're more, they're, they're, they're bigger fans of the cops or the state. They have faith in those institutions. And that's fine, that's allowed, but I'm not one of those people. And I wanted to make it very clear in this book what side I was on. I mean, 
a couple days ago, I was in Paris for May Day, International Workers' Day, and I got tear gassed by the cops. So, <laughs> with a whole bunch of other people. And that was just like a perfectly normal thing to happen. So it's, you know, this is a, not a unbiased book. It's not an unpolitically motivated book. But also it's the truth, right? That is the thing. History does not always cleave to a convenient narrative. <laughs> and there are a lot of folks in this book who are radicals, who are complicated, who you know, we can admire in some ways and deplore in others. Everything's a little bit gray, especially when you're dealing with labor, which is one of, I think, one of the few institutions in this country that really brings together all kinds of people. Because no matter who you are, almost everyone has a job or is going to have a job or had a job. And I probably didn't like it very much. So it's one of those uniting factors that pulls people together and forces people to work out their differences. Thank you for this cough drop. I feel like you're saving this whole situation. That's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are, these are the kind of stories that I wrote about in the book, and they're the kind of stories I'm interested in sharing because I think there are, there are enough books in writing about the, the big names, right? Like, we know about Cesar Chavez. We know about Mother Jones. You know, they're, they're both in the book, too, but they're kind of supporting characters, right? I wanted to know what everyone around them was up to, which is why I write more about Maria Marino, who was the first female farm worker to be hired as a union organizer in the US, and actually class with Cesar Chavez. He thought she was too mouthy. Right? And this is the kind of approach that I've, um, even when I was strictly writing about music, that was the approach I would take. I was, and I, I'm coming from the heavy metal world, which is uh, complicated. And even though it is, it has always been a really diverse place in terms of subculture, in terms of music, it's still dominated by a white dude with long hair. <laughs> and as what, as a person who is not well, not all of those things, <laughs> I felt it was it was much more interesting to find bands and labels that are run by women and queer folks and black or brown folks, disabled folks, like everyone who gets left out of that mainstream narrative. And that got really complicated because a lot of people in the metal community didn't want to hear about that. But I kept at it. And just kind of taking the skills I learned and figuring out how to get people to care about something they think is either not relevant to them or is weird or boring or just doesn't matter. Taking, you know, Going from Norwegian death metal to labor history is, is not as big of a leap as it might sound. <laughs> you know, I've, I've written about black metal for the New York Times, and I've written about labor unions for Teen Vogue. It's all about how you present your audience with the stories. And it, is, it does come down to stories, because facts are important, research is important, all of the, the structure and the, all, like the, the scaffolding is incredibly important. But you gotta add a little bit of flair. You gotta judge it up a little bit. You gotta bring some heart and bone and guts to the story, or people aren't gonna care. If I read you, if I had told you about those two people, and didn't add in the fun quotes, and didn't add in the explanations of violence, you probably would have had the reaction that you did. You know, that's something that I think is missing from a lot of the writing we see about labor. This is focused. It focuses more on the acronyms or the internecine union machinations that even I don't really care about that much. And it's my job to care about. You know, it comes down to the human beings that make all of this matter, that make all this work, whose actual work and sacrifices have gotten us to whatever point on the road to progress we've ended up on. And I feel like we have so much to learn from the people that, yes, that I wrote about in the book and that I couldn't fit in the book and that I couldn't even find because I'm not a trained researcher. Like, there's so much I wanted to put in here. And maybe I'll write another one after this. But I think the fact that it's not common knowledge that we here in Philadelphia in the 1910 had, had an interracial union run by a black man named Ben Fletcher that ran the docks and were explicitly anti-racist, anti-capitalist. Like, that's something kids should know about our city. You know, I mentioned Maria Marino earlier. She was an indigenous Mexican mother of, like, 
13, who was a farm worker her whole life, who spoke up, who, who got involved in the union and became the first woman farm worker hired as a union organizer in U.S. history. That's something people should know about. Robert Payne in Appalachia in the 1960s was a disabled black coal miner who led a series of wildcat strikes for black lung benefits to help everybody in his position. That He'd give that man a statue, you know? There's so many people that I think we would benefit from knowing about, and so many different perspective shifts that I think would really help in understanding our current moment. You know, talking about Marsha P. Johnson, obviously she's a queer icon, a trans icon, a black icon, also a labor icon because she organized sex workers. She was a labor organizer. You know, it's, there's so many intersections like this, whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, when so many of the most important leaders in that movement were also involved in labor, talking about Baird Rustin, the queer black man who organized the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, who was an outcast at the time because of his identity, his sexuality, but changed history anyway. You know, there, there's so many ways in which labor history and workers' history intersects with just American history and the American present. And it's just so important to me to share that with people because, like I said, the labor movement is something that is accessible to almost everybody. And any person throughout history that you, you admire, anyone who's been part of the, the struggles for queer trans liberation or women's rights, civil rights, like there is a labor component to that. You know, I think about in the 70s when we had the Section 504 protests and occupations. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but the longest nonviolent occupation of federal building in U.S. history was held by disabled activists who were trying to force the government to basically enforce a law that had already passed that was part of what was known as kind of the first civil rights law for disabled people, the Rehabilitation Act. They took over a bunch of federal buildings. In San Francisco, they occupied one for about a month. And that was only possible because of the support they got from people in other movements. The Black Panthers kept them fed. Church groups came and dropped off supplies. Uh, the Nationalist Union, they showed up, they offered them office space. When the leaders of the protest traveled to Washington, D.C. to sit down with the Senate, a lot of those folks used wheelchairs and other mobility aids. This was pre-ADA. They weren't getting on the subway. They weren't getting in a cab. But the Nationalist Union showed up with a box truck and a bunch of rope, and we're like, we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna get you where you need to go. And that kind of material solidarity, like that helped them win. That helped them get to where they needed to be. And there's so many different components there. There's a very obvious labor component, and there's so many other components too. I feel like I'm belaboring that point a little bit, but it's something that matters a lot to me as someone who came into labor from a totally different world, who never really thought about it, never thought it would apply to me, never thought it was something that I'd be interested in or that would matter to my life, and then ended up in a union that negotiated a contract that just changed my entire life, and then changed the trajectory of my career, because the longer I spent going to union meetings and blowing off metal shows to go, you know, go to the beer hall and talk to organizers, the more I realized, like, oh, Maybe this is a place where I could put my energy. Maybe metal will be okay without me for a little bit. Maybe I could try writing about this. And it worked. <laughs> you know, after I got laid off, uh, I freelanced like hell. And after about a year, I signed a contract for this book. And then I, then I started writing the book. And then the pandemic showed up, and it got a lot harder to write the book. But I finished it somehow. And now I'm here talking to you at a place that I went to school. and. Uh, almost graduated from. <laughs> I might pop over to Comet after this and be like, hey, like, can we just, you know, it's only like nine credits. <laughs> it's just math. I can't do math. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, a, that's a me problem. It's not a you problem. Um, all that to say is it's it's been really cool to come and share these stories with you and to talk a little bit about the book and the work that went into it. And my mindset going into it because I think it is it's pretty unique actually I know it's pretty unique because I've read so many labor books <laughs> um, some popular some academic and essentially this is the book that I wish I had come across when I was 
first becoming interested in labor because it, I, I really tried very hard to show that everyone belongs here. Everyone can relate to a story in this book, no matter who you are. Especially now, when so many people, especially queer and trans workers, are under attack. Like there's, this book is full of queer and trans people because again, these folks have always been here. We wouldn't be where we are without the sacrifices and the struggle that those workers went through. And so I feel like we're I'm supposed to leave a little bit of time for questions and conversation. I feel like I've been chatting a lot. The cough drops kicking in. <laughs> Yeah, if I can leave you with, with anything. I know this has kind of been an extended commercial for this book, but that's kind of what you have to do when you're a writer. you got to uh, learn how to hustle and tell people about, about your baby because you know, not everyone knows what goes into writing. It's kind of a magical process for a lot of people. And it is kind of, it is kind of magical, right? Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really trained. I've never really had a journalism class. Retrospect probably should have done that when I was here, but you know, 18, what did I know? <laughs> I learned how to read people instead, and you pick up the rest along the way. Yeah, I feel like I was building up to a point there, but I think I've made all the points I need to make. <laughs> and we're keeping it very informal here, obviously, so it's okay. I guess I would, yeah. yeah. Can, we, can we open it up? Yeah, let's, let's. Okay, I, 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 have a, I, have a, I have a comment, a, a general comment to the class, to the class, to the room, and, um, and a question. Mm. So the general comment is, um, reading this book, it really struck me that this should be on the curriculum of every history class in the nation. That we're taught, you know, about wars and the lives of the elite and politician, and that is sold as our history. This is a history of people, of working class, and everything in our lives that we enjoy is because people fought for it. Um, I mean, you read about the working conditions before labor, the working conditions, the hours, the ex exploitation. I mean, we, don't, we didn't even have weekends. They could employ us seven days a week. I mean, it was, it was crazy, and people don't know about this. People need to know about this, because this is the real history, and if we don't know about it, we're going to slide back. And the politicians are working really hard right now to slide us back. Ch child labor laws are being changed around this country to set us back 150 years to children working in in uh, slaughterhouses, the, one of the worst places for anyone to work is now become legal for children as young as 13 to work in certain states. It is crazy. So anyhow, that's my pitch for the book. That's incredible. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because it always confuses me, you talked about police cops, as you said, and, and, and being not our friends, but they're all unionized. All of them. Ain't that something? So what? <laughs> What's going on here? Why? Why? I mean, they enjoy the fruits of union. They actually have a great union that really sets them up for life. How can they then be deployed by the state to counter other people fighting for the exact same rights that they have through their union? You would think the cognitive dissonance would take hold at some point, but as as we've seen like very clearly throughout history and in more recent times, the Police unions do not see themselves as part of the labor movement, right? They see that <laughs> because they're not workers, you know, they're armed agents of the state. And when you have that, if an iron worker came in here and was like, I'm scared and shot one of us dead, they would go to jail. They would probably have a terrible time. But if, if, if a garment worker did that, forget about it. But if a cop came in and did that, like, how many cops have been let off in Philly recently? Didn't a couple cops get let off for like killing a little girl the other day? Uh, like fantability, like <laughs> the way the system is set up, it just completely privileges the, those class of employees above everybody else. And when you have that sort of structure propping you up, why would you care about other people? Honestly, you're not, uh, they're, they're not supposed to be unionized. <laughs> they were, I think 
think early, I think in the 1800s, some cops said, I think Boston tried to unionize and they got slapped down. Like, oh, we can't be having that. It's like why the military isn't unionized, why you know various forces like that aren't unionized. Like, it's too dangerous. Somehow it's just been allowed to happen here. And, I mean, the cop unions are just, it's just a repulsive abuse of power and it's just a stain on the labor movement that folks are able to say, oh, well, they're unionized, like, they're part of this. I, I've actually been part of efforts, like grassroots efforts, to pressure the AFL-CIO to expel IUPA, uh, the International Union of Police, uh, something, copied it. The only one that's under the AFL-CIO umbrella. And there's been significant pushback from that leadership, who's saying, you know, oh, well, they're part of the movement, they're workers, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's just part of this deeply entrenched, maybe, like, neoliberal refusal to understand the world as it is <laughs> or like just this, this 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 refusal to accept that the democratic party does is not our best friend all the time we don't have to follow all their policies it's i have a lot of like very political opinions about all of this so i'm trying to uh, to fear the slightly more professional side of things, but in fairness, I do have a guillotine tattoo and a Molotov cocktail <laughs> tattoo, so I can only do so much. Um, but really, and, and when we think about the police, like I've written a lot about this for the New Republic, for other places, just about the fact that police unions, even like outside of any political sentiment about cops and abolition and their the need for either, it just doesn't make sense, like the amount of power that has been concentrated by police unions, the lack of solidarity, the fact that police are used as strike breakers. They're black legs, they're the people that have come out and broken strikes. They are the people that were beating Clara Lemlich on the picket line during the uprising of the 20,000 in 1909 when female garment workers were struggling to get basic protections in the 1900s. And their unions and the fire unions are the only ones not under attack. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the firemen. I feel like everyone likes firemen. Why would you be a cop? Just be a fireman. <laughs> but there is, I mean, it is very dangerous. Police, and I mean, yeah, firefighters. They, they, they get lumped in as like the only okay you knew. They, they're, they're, they're weaponized against the rest of the movement. And that's not helpful either. I think there's just so little appetite by union leadership to really push back against that and interrogate that, even though there might be a lot more appetite among the rank and file and the membership. I think a lot of it just comes down to politics and cowardice and just the people unwilling to grapple with the broader role that police play in our existence, let alone in the labor movement. It's, it's kind of a, it's a whole big thing. <laughs> If I was a different type of person, I'd be like, this is why we need to vote. But we also have a mirror election coming up. I don't know, man. It's it's all very personal living here, right? Like we have we can see what happens when you neglect people and oppress people and take away any hope of opportunity or advancement or survival. Yeah, it all comes down to capitalism, right? You also have like six or seven police forces in this neighborhood. Right. And oh, that's so right. you would think that we would be like the safest block in the city. Um, but from my experience, I've been in Philadelphia for 10 years now, and I've only experienced violence with the cops. Well, that's their job. Yeah. <laughs> that's what yeah. they're... Yeah, you're not a building. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, right? Well, 
Well, this is good. This is like a, a fun combo. Right? Yeah. This is great. No, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like really enjoying this critique of capitalism and, and cops. Um, I think it's awesome. I wanted to bring us back to writing and ask you writing questions because I think it's so fascinating that it's like you did music journalism, then you became a labor writer, and then you wrote this book, which is very much like a history book. Right, like you're weird, right? you're a historian, <laughs> right? And like um, thinking about my own like writing path as like an academic, like I try to do like one type of writing, and it's so hard, and it takes forever, and it gives me so much anxiety, right? And like I'm so impressed that you've moved through these different genres and these different topics. And so I wanted to ask you like just what the process was like writing a history book, and like what your research was like, and the challenges you came up with that. And then I have a second question, not to like take up so much space, but I'm really curious what you think about AI, because I know that part of the strike for the Writers Guild right now right. is related to AI and like ChatGPT and this sort of like automation of writing labor, and so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about that too. I don't understand AI, but I know I don't like it. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I guess working backwards, yeah, it, it is a big part of what's going on with the strike right now, because there's this this hunger among studio exec executives and all kinds of other bosses to automate us out of existence. They're like, oh, we'll just have robot workers take care of everything. I was actually just reading a really great book by my buddy Brian Merchant about the Luddites, um, and about which it's, it's kind of used as a, oh, you're just like bad at technology, like a weird kind of slur now, but there was an actual movement of working class people in England, like at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, where new technology, in that case it was like, spinning jennies and gig printing, basically machines that made it easier to, that kind of automated the process of spinning and making clothing. And that stole, that basically displaced thousands by thousands of skilled artisans who've been doing the, those jobs for centuries. And a bunch of them got together and were like, you know what, no. And they went around and just smashed up the machines in tons of different factories. And they put up a resistance and actually the crown had to send thousands of troops to put down that rebellion and murder a bunch of the people that led it to get them to knock it off. So I'm not saying we need to blow up like all the computer servers. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like it's just a part of the conversation we have to hold on to because there's been ever since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, there have been efforts to automate workers out of existence because we're complicated and we complain and you have to pay us. And sometimes we unionize and cause problems. It's like in Amazon, where they treat people like robots anyway. They're trying to just create more robots, and a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. And it's just, we don't have, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Like, it's kind of fun we can get little computers to do stuff, but maybe we should just not. Yeah. You know, life is hard enough without having your boss be an algorithm or losing your job because some robot can do something 0.4 seconds faster than you. Or like write a bad script that you can like hire a human to come in and clean out. That's one of the, the things studio bosses are trying to get to yeah. do with the writers. It's just like, it just comes down to a fundamental disrespect for workers mm -hmm. and for our labor and for our lives that is endemic among the ruling class, yeah. I believe. But uh, for, your, for your other question about how I pulled this off, whew, it was, so I approached this book the way I kind of approach everything. It's, I feel like it's just a really long blog. <laughs> I, 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 kind of, I approached each chapter as if I was writing an article, mm -hmm. but I just had lots of space mm -hmm. and I was left totally unsupervised for like a year. Mm -hmm. And so I felt, cause whenever I, I write a piece for Teen Vogue or New Republic, wherever, I always write too much and they cut it down and they break my heart and we keep going, but in a book, I can write as much as I want it. Though they did still end up writing, cutting like 20,000 words. Um, yeah, because this is fun. Like, I like writing and I love reading and researching and talking to people. Like, this is the best thing ever. And just fitting it together in my head and coming up with phrases in the shower and then writing it down real quick. Like, this is, I think it's kind of the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> And it, it kind of comes easily to me. Like the research part was a lot tougher because I'm not trained as an academic researcher. I don't have access to a lot of the archives and stuff. So I was definitely sending a lot of panic three and tweets like, can somebody like send me this article or like screenshots? Like I have a friend who 
who was like a grad student at Penn who went into the library and took photos of some stuff that I could be careful about. Um, yeah, because it's that's something too, like writing a history book, I think perhaps the assumption is that I guess just write regular people that aren't in the academic world are not like why would someone like that write a book about history so it's not set up access wise for someone like me to really get in there and get to all the, the, the stuff like the good stuff but i found a lot of good stuff anyway and i have a lot of friends in academia that helped out and send me things i also just read a lot of books and talked to a lot of people and did a lot of like frantic online research and i also have like a pretty extensive labor history library at home because I am a giant nerd and I and also like I guess the way my brain works I have a lot of I'm just interested in history in general and I have a lot of books and there's a lot in this book that came from books that are not necessarily labor books just like different pieces of different eras I kind of see myself as sort of a magpie like I just sort of collect things I think are interesting and find ways to sew them all together in a way that I think makes sense which is why you have why this is not, um, like the way that it's ordered and the stores that I chose are probably not what you're gonna typically find in a labor history book. Like my chapter on disabled workers talks about the sideshow and about black lung and about the section 504 protests. And I think it ends with one of my friends talking about how she doesn't wanna work at all. <laughs> and I think maybe that's not the most academic way to approach it, but I think maybe that makes it a little bit more approachable. And that's what I aim to do with all of my work. I, I try to find ways to make it And if I can write something that he picks up and he's like, you yeah, okay, <laughs> then I, that's a win. I'm not trying to impress, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I want to share these things with people. Yeah. And also like, I like throwing in my little flair, like my little fancy words, like writing is still fun, but I wanted to write something that pretty much anybody could pick up and read on their lunch break or on the bus. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the guiding principle. But also, I'm kind of self-taught in everything, so I probably couldn't write a different book. <laughs> like I can't do the, um, like the, the more academic style, because I know that's really intense and like very specific, like I can't pull that off, but I can tell you a story. <laughs> and I learned how to do that when I was trying to convince mainstream outlets, like, no, like, is the, this new cannibal course record, like, actually matters. Let me explain to you why this is something that is, or has artistic value. Kind of just figure out how to trick people into caring about the things you think are cool. And I just happen to think labor history is really cool. <laughs> but yeah, some academics were, like, really mean to me when this came out. It's like, you didn't cite this or this or this. You didn't do this right. I'm like. I don't know, people seem to like it. Yeah. That's the thing, it's like a popular history, right? It's not, um, there, there's different ways to write about history, and I think they're all fine, and uh, I don't like being gatekept. But nobody does, and that's why it's really cool that y'all invited somebody like me to come talk to you guys, because I think it's important to, uh, to show that there's a lot of different ways to be a writer, and a lot of different ways to tell stories, and they're all fine. Like, you don't have to be any one specific thing. You can be yourself, which sounds very like Kumbaya and Hokey, but it works out sometimes. I mean, look at me. Look at the state of me. I don't like, <laughs> when I sell my next book, I'm finally getting my neck tattooed. Like, well, I'm getting more of them. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's always very surreal to me that I get to do things like this, like, just, like, being very candid. Because I still kind of feel like, you know, that, that little dirt bag that was going out past 50th Street to go to basement shows when I was 22. But I mean, I still do that stuff too. I just happened to figure out how to piece stories together in a way that makes people care. Once you figure out how to do that, the rest doesn't really matter. People have to pay attention to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll be a real professional role model up here, but it's the truth. We're going to segue into the uh, workshop section of this, oh, yeah. and so let's...